are very fortunate tonight to have with us Dr. Matteo Garbolato, who is the director of the uh, UC Berkeley um, uh, Forest and Pathology and Mycology Department, who was kind enough to accept my request to talk to us because we've had members asking about, you know, why are all these trees dying in, in the Bay Area? And so he's, he's the authority. I'm so grateful that he has agreed to speak with us. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mateo. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Liz. Um, certainly, you are a group of people I'm very pleased to be talking to. Why haven't you invited me sooner? <laughs> No, it's okay. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for that introduction about Native people. I'm, I'm married to one, so I'm very, very happy that we are finally acknowledging that we are living on land that is not really truly ours. But, um, and I just just because of the things that I heard at the beginning, I just wanted to bring up um, <laughs> a paper that I just published recently, a uh, strong collaborative effort about a couple of years about to looking at, we are all living a, a, a period in, 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 an, in, in an age of um, incredible change and it's very scary. And uh, a group of us just proposed to look back in order to know how to look forward um, in, um, in a productive and, and a hopeful way. And uh, this, this paper is, uh, is on my website and we'll, I will present my website at the end, at the end of the talk. So my, my name is Matteo. Everybody calls me Matteo. Um, I'm a professor at Berkeley, but I am also the um, forest uh, health specialist for the entire state of California. So I'm in charge of dealing with dramatic uh, forest health issues when nobody else can. So you can imagine that I have, a, I, have a I, mean, I have a fantastic job when I can figure out what's going on, but otherwise it, it, can, be, it can be fairly challenging. Also the university in its wisdom decided that one person it's enough to cover the entire state from the Oregon to the Mexican border, which I, I can say it's a, it's a pretty challenging job. And so today I'm gonna to talk, um, really the title is, is not quite right, although the, the, the context is right, and it's a very ambitious talk. Um, I really will talk more about uh, diseases that really uh, are killing our forest and, 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 and in a way that is most likely not really fully reversible. And this is where the big difference, what, what I will talk about today is different from fires that are cyclical, is different from logging that can be stopped. Um, the uh, outbreaks of infectious diseases I will talk about, once they become established, they're pretty much unstoppable. And um, that's why they've been under the radar a little bit, not all of them. Some of them are, are actually very well known, but a lot of them are under the radar, but they represent a much bigger threat than the, uh, the other threats that were mentioned today, like uh, you know, urbanization and climate change per se, um, and, um, and logging. So uh, I will talk about several things that are going on. I will also talk about what's going on in the Bay Area with the trees that are dying. Um, what I will talk about basically today is, is mostly emergent diseases. And um, so actually my, my talk is gonna be uh, giving you a, a, a kind of an interesting way of looking at things. And it's, it's, um, it's an angle that it's, uh, it's not clear in the title itself, but emergent diseases are basically diseases that are on the rise. So they're becoming more and more relevant. And I'm talking about forest diseases. And in general, most people um, equate Maybe somebody can um, uh, mute themselves because we, we can hear we can hear the noises. But anyway, when we think of emerging diseases, we can put them in two different bins. One bin is the, the bin that we almost all of us know about. It's the one of exotic pathogens. So these are microbes that are brought over to one part of the world from a different part of the world. And as a result, in general, they find uh, native uh, plant populations are uh, very susceptible. The same way that humans um, are susceptible to diseases that come from different parts of the world, the COVID being an, an excellent example. Um, but there is a different category of emerging diseases. And actually what's happening now in the Bay Area is actually caused by the second group of emerging diseases for the most part. These are diseases that are um, true outbreaks 
Um, so high infection rates, high levels of mortality, but they're caused by native microbes. So it's a little bit difficult to understand how a native microbe could cause so much disease, but there, there, there is a reason. So these are good organisms that um, are necessary organisms in a dynamic forest that all of a sudden uh, become particularly aggressive. And uh, in definitely climate is changing the paradigm, is changing the balance in our forest. And some of these organisms take advantage of uh, the weakness that trees are experiencing because of climate change. Or um, another reason is that we may have altered the ecosystem. For instance, logging alters the ecology of our forest to the point that native organisms can become aggressive or planting the wrong trees in the wrong place. And in the Bay Area, certainly that's true. And that's that's actually what's going on right now. So these are all emerging diseases, but the, the last ones that I talked about are caused by native microbes that, that have become aggressive. In terms of what we see happening, so if you look at these two graphs here, on the left-hand side, and, and think of these as number of, number of cases, right? Um, this is a human example, but it works the same for trees. So th this is the number of infections that are happening. Um, we, when we have emergent diseases, um, uh, we normally see a, a, a very um, significant increase in number of infections and in, uh, in, in uh, often in number of, of deaths. Um, the patterns are a little bit different. When we have an exotic microbe, no, normally the, the uh, rate of infection goes up very rapidly. That's, that's the box on the left there, West Nile virus. So it's normally because there's very little resistance in the population, we will have a very large number of trees or of humans, in the case of West Nile virus, that become infected and you get to really high levels of infection quite rapidly. And then very often you have, you have a bust cycle. So you have a boom and bust cycle. So this, it, it cycles back and down if there is any resistance to the population. On the right-hand side though, I show you an example that's actually scarier of native, native organisms that become prevalent in the population because of the reasons that I mentioned earlier on. If, if you look at the number of cases, it's actually much higher. Uh, but the process of, of, of the, the infection rates go up a little bit but more gradually. So it's not obvious that this is happening, but the end effect is the same. In fact, it could actually be worse. So together we can imagine how, you know, if we had two different types of, you know, you know uh, two types of infectious diseases affecting humans, uh, we would be very worried rather than just having to deal, deal with COVID. So the same thing uh, um, um, applies to, to forest ecosystems. And I always like to say this paper because this is kind of the, um, the milestone paper in 1997 that really made it clear that um, um, there were three major drivers that were changing our forests. Um, and uh, this was climate change. So already in 1997, Vitusek and, and colleagues had figured it out. Um, urbanization and anthropogenic change. So not just urbanization per se, but also all the activities that are corollary to urbanization. And then biological invasions. And biological invasions was, is how I got involved in, in, in this big field because a lot of these infectious diseases are actually invasions. We, we know now because everybody understands, I speak of COVID, there was an invasion of a virus that was not present. Most of these um, exotic pathogens are actually invading ecosystems where they didn't, um, they didn't exist and where they didn't belong originally. And if we look historically at forest invasive diseases, um, and we, you know, through time, um, obviously we can see there is, um, I mean, it, it's fairly uh, intuitive. There is a, a sharp increase in the number of these invasive diseases, which obviously it's, it's, it's not a good, um, it's not good news. These are um, metadata for Europe, but uh, it's probably the best study ever published on the subject. And so I'd like to present it, it applies to North America as well. And so you can see actually the, the, the curve is, the, the, the uh, slope of the curve is, is becoming steeper and steeper with time. Uh, so there are more and more diseases that are brought from other parts of the world that we call exotic. Um, and they're becoming established in, um, in different parts of the world. And the reasons for that is um, fairly obvious. Uh, the um, volume of goods that are traded and also the speed at which uh, goods are traded. So not only we have 
a globalized world where you know goods are traded um, throughout the world. Um, but also it happens much more rapidly. And speed is um, of the essence in this case because some of these micros will, will probably survive a long trip on a boat in the 1800s and may take like a year to go from one continent to the other. Uh, but they will certainly survive uh, one week on, on a cargo ship uh, between uh, Japan and, and California. So, so the speed is, is in, uh, in itself a, a game changer. And um, interestingly, uh, and this is where I will say things that are a little controversial, uh, but hopefully I think I will have a captive audience with you. Um, there are some, some items that are treated that are more dangerous than others. So some, some items have been identified as being carriers of these exotic microbes. And I don't have time to go through all of them, but you can see there's one here, and the colors are a little misleading, but if you look at the, the red bar, that has been consistently through time the um, the most significant substrate or, or, or the, the goods that the more significantly have moved invasive forest diseases around the world. And those are living plants. And here I will ask a question. It's, it's, it seems incredible that we need to move living plants across the world. I understand food, I understand seed, but living plants is, um, is quite, um, it, I, I quite still don't quite understand it. And the vast majority of these living plants that are moved around the world are uh, because of the ornamental industry. So the ornamental, ornamental industry has the largest share of these plants that are moved around. There is another share of, of plants that are used in, in, in reforestation and restoration projects, but ornamental plants um, are, uh, it's a gigantic business and these plants are moved throughout the globe and inevitably, to, so that we can plant an exotic plant in our garden, we end up introducing a, a microbe. And you should be warned for warned that we don't have a single instance of a forest invasive disease that has ever been uh, successfully eradicated. So all of these numbers that you see, all of these bars, it's something that was moved somewhere else, started a disease and um, was never eradicated. So we can fool ourselves. Um, oh yeah, it doesn't matter if we introduce these organisms, we'll be able, sorry about that, we'll be able to deal with them. So once, you, once these organisms arrive in a new home, there are many things that um, will determine whether they'll be successful or not. And the vast majority, some of you are familiar with this one to 10 rule. So out of 10 organisms that are moved from one region of the world to the other, only, only one will succeed. In fact, when we're talking about microbe, probably it's more like one to a thousand. So really well, what I will talk about is apparently the exception to the rule, but unfortunately that, that exception is what is making a difference for California and many other parts of, of, of the world. And I don't have time to talk about all these different factors that will determine success. But one of the I wanted to emphasize is the number of introductions. And this is not a trivial one. So unfortunately, we, we have a system, where there's a political system in place, both in the European Union and the United States. I work with both governments, although I talk if you don't listen. Um, we know that the, um, as for other bi biological invasions, the number of times that an organism is introduced actually determines the, uh, the likelihood that organism will be successful in the new region of the world where it's been moved to. And this is an important concept to, to understand. So simply saying, oh, well, this organism has already been moved, so we don't have to worry about it. It's a terrible mistake because another strain of the same organism will arrive and together the two strains will do better than just one strain, then a third one will arrive. And together the three strains will do better than the two that were there originally. We don't really have a system in place to prevent this process because normally once an organism is established, the uh, regulations tend to lax and the controls are not as, uh, as uh, significant. And then what happens is these microbes start to replicate. Um, a little bit like uh, the virus, you know, uh, populations increase and, and infection goes up. And so if the uh, transmission rate um, is, uh, is above one, then the organism becomes invasive. And this, the rate of invasion can be different. So some are fast, some are slow, 
But nonetheless, once it's over one, inevitably the organism um, starts invading our ecosystems. And if the organism in question is a pathogen, the, a, a tree pathogen, the effect is tree disease um, and very often tree mortality. So this is not just um, you know, a little lizard that's uh, been introduced or, 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 or an organism which may um, have uh, cause havoc on the environment. This is worse because it, directly, just by definition, the pathogen survives by causing disease and by killing its host. So inevitably a pathogen that's moved will, uh, will um, Will, will be problematic. And so in my mind, this is my uh, category. We have three different, I have three different scenarios and I'll talk about these different scenarios. So the, mm -hmm. the, worst, the worst scenario is actually the one where the microbes are introduced straight in the forest or in a natural ecosystem, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a forest. It could be a shrublet, I don't care. I protect all of those. Anything that's natural, it's, it's uh, something that I work on. So obviously that is the worst scenario, right? Because we're, 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 putting, the, uh, um, we're putting the fell right where it wants to be. So we're making, we're paving the way for its spread. There is an intermediate uh, scenario, which is the one where the pathogen is, um, is introduced in a, in, a, in a situation that's artificial, for instance, gardens. And this is the case of sudden, sudden or death. So sudden or death was actually introduced multiple times for about 20 years in, the, in people's gardens. But because people's gardens often are in, in the forest, especially in more affluent neighborhoods, the jump is not that large. And so inevitably the, the microbe will jump from the garden setting into a natural setting. And then the best scenario, I mean, best for us is, um, when the organism is introduced in agricultural settings. And I say best because traditionally, differently from gardens of, of homes, which can, can be in the forest, just think about the peninsula or even the, you know, even the Oakland Hills and Marin County, where homes are built in, in, in a forest setting. Um, agricultural, even in California, is still um, disjunct from, from natural situations. So you have, uh, and, and for instance, in Italy it would be different because in Italy agriculture and forests are much more uh, interconnected, but not so in, uh, in California. So if we introduce pathogens in an agricultural setting, it may take some time for it to move into a forest, but eventually it will be. And this is what I will talk about today. But unfortunately, the regulators, when they see a pathogen in an agricultural setting, they're not worried about the forest because they say, oh, okay, whatever. The farmer that's taking care of the field is gonna take care of the pathogen too. And they don't understand that it's, it's, it's impossible for a farmer, even if it's a large corporation to really do that. And so little by little, eventually the organism will find its way in a natural ecosystem. And these are the pathogens that really have been under the radar, or even if everybody knows about them, which is you know counterintuitive. We know about them because they are in agricultural systems and there is an immediate economic effect of the organism, yet we have done the least about these um, and now we're paying the consequences. Unfortunately, just in the last 10, 20 years, we've understood that that's, that was going on. And so we start with the first example, which is what I think, this is very brand new research that I'm sharing with you. This is a huge issue in California right now, especially in Northern California, but my colleagues at UC Davis are, are studying the same phenomenon in Southern California, and they're telling me they're finding the same thing. And um, I will talk about um, a genus of microbes. Um, it's called Phytophthora. And Phytophthora is, is famous for, for sudden of death, but it's also famous for the uh, late potato blight, which caused the potato famine, the, the Irish famine um, affecting potatoes in, in the 1800s. Um, and there is, um, unfortunately, we have discovered recently that a large number of these phytophthora are being introduced through restorations in restoration sites. And uh, uh, once these phytophthora are introduced, this is kind of the outcome, okay? This is an introduced phytophthora. This is actually phytophthora cinnamomai. It comes from Papua New Guinea originally, and somehow you tell me how, but I, don't, you know, actually I know why. I don't tell you. It made its way into California, and when I saw these hills, these are hills in the Sierra Nevada foothills near Ion, I actually thought this was wildfire. I mean, look at this picture. It looks like wildfire went through it, but it's actually a root disease, and it's phytophthora, and it's 
it's killing 100% of two manzanita species that are growing on these uh, soils that are also particularly difficult soils. So there's not very much else that grows um, in these soils. So this is the end consequences. But what has been happening is that these Phytophthora species, um, and Phytophthora are microbes, they're not fungi, which is rare for tree pathogens. They actually are relatives of kelp. So they're originally aquatic organisms. And when I started working at Berkeley 30 years ago, we thought that all Phytophthora in forests were mostly soil borne and water borne because their origin is in water. Um, and so about 10 years ago, people started finding multiple of these Phytophthora species and some of them for sure exotic in restoration sites. So these are actually sites that people were spending a lot of money to bring, bring back to their native status, right? So of course we have, you know, we know that in the area there's not very, very much that's uh, in its original <laughs> state. And so, um, you know, we, uh, a lot of people, I'm sure the Sierra Club too, actually, there, there are projects where we, we go and restore, we try to restore, the, in this case, shrublands. And uh, these restoration efforts have been failing for decades. And the ecologists would say, oh, well, they're failing because it's too hot or it's too cold. You know, they, they, were, and they were totally missing that it was not that it was too hot or too cold or too dry. It was because the shrubs that, we, that were being planted, most of these restorations are done by planting plants, okay? They're not done using seed. The plants were already infected by these pathogens. And so people started reporting this and so, they asked me to actually um, provide evidence that the restorations were indeed introducing these uh, exotic, um, not just one, that's a problem, multiple exotic microbes in Northern California, um, tried to figure out how that was happening because we weren't really sure it was just coincidence uh, or was it really uh, something that the people were doing during the restoration efforts. Um, and so we started our, our study and we decided to, to look at uh, throughout, you know, in, in three different counties in the Bay Area, we would have plots that were next to each other. Um, so we, we would have a, a restored a plot, which would be basically what I mean is, is a plot where plants were planted. Normally it's native plants that actually, they should be native plants that are planted. Um, and normally failing. So we would know, we would go to say, then we would also test, uh, um, a site that was identical ecologically, so with the same cover, but that had not been planted. So that would be the kind of the model that was being followed to restore the site, but it was untouched. And then we would actually look at sites that were outside of the restoration. So they, they would be considered natural uh, sites, but they would be intersected by roads or culverts or streams, something that would potentially carry these waterborne and soilborne pathogens. Then we also looked in uplands and lowlands because normally these soilborne pathogens tend to accumulate in lowlands. And then we, we had an hypothesis. The hypothesis was that these pathogens came from the, the nurseries. So plant nurseries that were providing the plant material. And so these are kind of the, some images of the sites, multiple sites in multiple counties. Um, and of course, um, we were right. It was not that it was too dry, it was too hot, but actually we, found, we started finding Phytophthora on these uh, failing restorations. And it, it, it was very impressive because not only were the plants dying, but also there was no, um, uh, there was no renovation. The, you know, basically th these pathogens have a dual effect. They kill the plant and they also kill all of the regeneration. So it, it basically destroys the future for those particular sites for the particular uh, plant species that's affected. And three species, which are the three most widely used species in restoration. So sticky monkey flower, blue blossom and California coffee berry were very heavily infected. Um, isolation success was always lower from the low, uh, higher from the lowlands, confirming that potentially uh, it was an organism that moved around following water and soil. And then we had one that was uh, abundant, uh, more abundant than the other one, Phytophthora crassamura. This is important because we, we did fur further studies. And we used this as a kind of a poster child because this has the, only been described in Italy and nowhere else in the world. So we knew that when we were dealing with Crestomora, most likely we were dealing with an exotic Phytophthora, but we found about other 10 ones, just this one study that I'm talking about.
And these are kind of the numbers that we were getting. So we were getting a very high um, um, isolation from, um, this, is, this is percentage of plants that were giving us uh, these phytophthora. Um, so in restoration, you can see there's a blue bar that's very high. And unfortunately, um, there's a very high bar also in sites that were nearby restoration. This was worse than we expected because it told us immediately that those pathogens had already moved outside of the restoration site. And then in our control sites, we never found them. So control sites, remember, they were identical, ecologically speaking, the same plant species, but they had not been disturbed. And also they didn't have any of these paths and culverts and you know anything that would move the pathogen was not available in these sites, but they were nearby. So none, none there. So we were able to prove scientifically, so this paper was published this year, that um, Indeed, um, it is a restoration that is bringing these exotic organisms. And this is the effect. So that you have healthy plants here. This is sticky monkey flower. Um, and then you, have, you can see what the result is on the right side, inside and in the middle of plants that are infected. And in these restoration sites, most of the plants looked like the plants on the right and on the left. Some other examples here, some close-ups. Um, you can see the brown that you see are dead plants. Um, and then this is blue blossom, I think. And then you can see we, we actually were able to, I took pictures of these uh, lesions that were caused by phyt these phytophthora. These were actually uh, splash generated. So basically the soil, well, the, the soil was being splashed on the lower part of the stem and the stem was being lesioned. And what that brown that you see there in the middle, it's basically killing, it's killing the cane or, or, or the stem. And so um, this was the first study was published this year where there was a structured control study where we were looking at restorations, disturbed sites near restorations and um, uh, undisturbed sites. Um, and the results that I've just shown you, we were able to show that uh, indeed, um, we are, our restorations are actually doing the opposite of what they're supposed to be doing because uh, the plants die and all that remains is the pathogen and the pathogen is moving into the natural ecosystem. Um, so the next question was, um, where were they coming from? So uh, why do we find these phytophthora? And these are, in this study, these are all the phytophthora that we actually found um, on the three different main hosts. And the one in bold, I hope you can see that, the one that are in bold are actually the ones that we have found previously, just a year before in another study where we were actually testing plants in production facilities that were selling the plant stock for the restorations. So, you know, we, we kind of knew that this, this was inevitable because we had found these, the same phytophthora in the restorations, but, you know, you need to actually link the dots. And we were able to link the dots and, and uh, everything that you see in bold, we had found in a, plant production facility that specialize on restoration plant stock. And then we found them again in these restorations. So we actually, we really closed the, um, you know, the, 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 the circle of understanding what was going on. And so we, we did a little bit more studies because it gets worse. So we, we picked Krasamura, Phytophthora Krasamura, because remember that was the most abundant Phytophthora. So that made the study a little bit easier for us. We just picked this one, this is what happens. On, on these plants that were infected by Crossamora. Um, and we actually, um, we did kind of a genetic analysis. And what, what you see here is a genetic tree. And these boxes are very closely related groups of strains of the same microbe. And in red is the one from Italy. So immediately you can see that the ones in California are not quite identical to the one from Italy. Uh, so probably they don't come directly from Italy. They may have come from somewhere else. And now you, you can see um, that several of these boxes were found both in the wildlands and in nurseries. So every time that we found both of them together, because genetically they're unique, we actually knew that the, ch the chances were that the wildland had received these uh, isolates from the nurseries, because genetically they had the same signature. But we were not just happy with that. We, we moved on and we actually looked at the morphology. And on the right hand side, what, what you see is, um, is a spore type. So these are spore types that are produced by Phytophthora crassabura. And we were able to, to actually show that the, the spores that were produced by strains that we found in the restorations had the same identical type of spores that we found in the nursery. 
And then we, we looked for something else. We also looked for resistance to fungicides. And this is very important because when microbes are um, spend a, a, a portion of their life in an artificial setting, for, especially in, in, a, in a nursery setting, they're exposed to chemicals and they become resistant to chemicals. And the, um, the, resist, the issue of resistance to chemicals is, is not trivial because um, it's not just resistant to resistance to chemicals that shows up, but it's also, well, it's not going. Okay, but uh, there are other things that can happen, but we were just studying one, but when we find this, normally we find other traits that, are, that mutate, that change. And um, what you see here is the higher up is the dot, the more resistant is it, it, it is to chemical, a specific chemical. This is a chemical that specifically targets uh, Phytophthoras. And as you can see, um, actually the most resistant strain that we found was from restoration sites. And then you can see nursery, nursery, restoration, 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 nursery. So if you look at the top four ones, it was clear that those um, strains uh, from restoration sites came through from a nursery because they were resistant to a chemical that doesn't exist in nature. So they must have acquired this resistance through their life uh, experience in a uh, plant production facility. And in a previous study, just uh, two years ago or three years ago, we had shown that um, this, these are two strains of the same microbe, like in the middle with the arrows. And the further up to the right it is, the more aggressive it means that it kills the plants more, more, more easily. So this is statistically not very significant, but we had, we had shown that the same species was much more aggressive. So the one, the one that you see all the way to the right is as aggressive as it could be. This one was from a nursery. The one that's above it is actually from a natural ecosystem. So we, we, we provided some evidence, although anecdotal in this case, that um, not only you're introducing an exotic organism, but you're also introducing an organism that's modified. There's been so much pressure in these plant production facilities that it's not the same as it was before going through the plant production facility. And so in conclusion, we have multiple lines of evidence indicating the introduction of exotic phytophthora in wildlands. And this is happening through the use of infected plant stock grown in infested nurseries. Uh, the strains that have been introduced can be more aggressive because of their history in artificial environments. Um, and we also uh, have shown that these phytophthoras are moving outside of the restoration sites. So not only the millions of dollars spent on the restorations are wasted, but the entire ecosystem is threatened because the uh, pathogen survives and it moves out of the restoration sites into, into natural settings. The, um, this part of the talk, I wanted to actually end in a, with, with, with a good note because we, uh, we worked very hard. We actually were able to find some production facilities that willingly collaborated with us in a study. We basically told them what they were supposed to, to do to produce clean plants, okay? Without any phytophthora. And we were dealing with 10, 12 species. And uh, we told them what to do. And I don't have time to go into this detail. And a year later, we went to this, to this nursery. Some of them said yes, some of them said no. And interestingly enough, the ones that actually followed the protocols, and we actually were checking periodically that the protocols were being followed, a year later, all of the plants that we tested were fully clean, 100%. Uh, but of course, there is a cost associated with that, and there is an effort. So, uh, so it does, otherwise everybody would do it. So it's not something that everybody can do voluntarily without putting effort and, and money. So you got to put the money on the table. But um, it can be done. So we were able to do it in a year, and this was not a UC Berkeley. This was actually working in the um, actual production um, production uh, nurseries. And people were criticizing me for doing this study because they said, oh, you should just mimic, uh, you should mimic a production facility at Berkeley and then pr prove it there and say, yeah, but I don't care. If I do it at Berkeley, I know I'm going to be able to get rid of the pathogen. I actually want to see that my prescriptions, my guidelines work in the real world. And it was very criticized. It was difficult to publish the paper, but then people got it. Yeah, it makes sense because now we don't have to test it again because you've already tested it in the real world. 
And because we're talking about, so let's move on to the second case. The one that it's, it's that's the worst possible case scenario because we are bringing the pathogen to the forest. The second worst case scenario is the one where we, we bring the pathogen to these artificial settings and then the pathogen uh, runs out. And I think you, unless you lived in a cave for the last 20 years, you probably have heard about sudden or death. Um, I was one of two people that discovered the organism that causes sudden or death, but I was actually the one that um, determined that the sudden or death pathogen had been introduced in California through the use of infected ornamental plants. So these are not restoration plants. These were ornamentals. And this is um, a much worse uh, deadly threat because ornamentals are sold everywhere. Everybody buys ornamentals and uh, they're, they're moved everywhere. So we're talking about massive, a massive mechanism of introduction. And, and this is why, remember when I was saying you repeat introductions are, um, you know, is um, what makes perfect, it's repeat introductions. So in this case, without knowing, there was a repeat mechanism that was very, you know, very repeated through time and through space because these plants were infected and nobody knew that they were infected because the pathogen that causes sudden of death was uh, unknown to man. So it was like, you know, like COVID-19, nobody had ever seen it before. And um, um, incidentally, it is the first phytophthora that actually in the forest that's capable of moving through the air. So this is an example now that's interesting because not only it was introduced differently, uh, but it was also introduced uh, um, and now it moves through the air. Although it is very heavy, so it doesn't move very far, but obviously it's a different uh, game altogether because we don't need to move water and soil. It moves by itself uh, from plant to plant. Um, and then the, you know, the sudden death is uh, incredibly important. It's probably together with the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, bark beetle outbreaks, which are cyclical and natural. But in terms of numbers, after the bark beetle outbreaks, sudden death is the largest individual cause of tree mortality in California. It is exclusively present on the coast, okay, and immediately um, inland uh, from the coast. And uh, I don't have time to read all of this, but the, the impacts are very significant. And over 50 million trees have been, have been killed already. The numbers are actually quite accurate. Um, and it's an ongoing threat because it has only occupied 30% of the coastal forest that it can occupy. So based on the temperature requirements and the host, we know it still has 70% more of forest to occupy. And it already has caused a huge, huge devastation with all these different um, uh, effects on ecology and, 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 and society. Uh, I mean, both Europeans and native people uh, have a very strong bond with, uh, with, with uh, the trees that are killed, tan oaks and oaks, for completely different reasons. Um, and it's, that's a complex issue. So it's really affecting society in multiple ways, and it's affecting the ecology. And one interesting thing is, you know, when I, the New York Times wanted to do a piece, and I think they did a piece, well, they did a piece on, on the discovery. We were on the front page of the New York Times, but they wanted to do a, a piece that they described it. And then the journalist was not happy because the forest was still green. And so he was more impressed by the little fire that had burnt a few trees without knowing that those trees would have come back, but he didn't understand that the forest that he was looking at had no oaks, no acorns no mushrooms. So all of those things were lost, but he still saw the redwoods and the bay laurels. So the forest looked green, but so this is why I didn't present the statistics to show you how much forest has decreased in California because they don't include the, the changes that a pathogen like this does. So by taking away oaks and tan oaks, we have taken away keystone species in our forests. And so these are the multiple ecological impacts. You can look at them. I don't, you know, I don't need to really talk about them. But what, what you should know is that um, the pathogen is called Phytophthora remoral, which is impossible to pronounce. I didn't name it. I actually let somebody, somebody else name it. Um, but it's not a single pathogen. It's actually in, in both, it's present both in North America and in Europe. And there are four different subspecies of the pathogen. And each one of them is actually quite different. In California, until last year, we only had one. It comes from Southeast Asia. 
Um, and it's been moved around the world by the ornamental trade. And it can infect hundreds of host species. And depending on the species, it can be a mild disease or it can be a deadly disease. So it's a very complex system. And here in this slide, you see all those colored lines within continents in between continents, that's actually proven. And I was actually the one that proved most of these lines. So this is movement that occurred between and within continents because of the movement of infected ornamental plants. So pretty major. And this is the paper that actually, it was very interesting because the ornamental industry told me and they, they fought the university very hard they told me that they had they had got it from the forest. So they they want they wanted to convince us that they were the victims. So they didn't bring the pathogen. The forest gave, you know, the forest was, was responsible for the pathogen. And so what you see here, it's a pyramid, and on top, um, it's actually the origin. It's like talking about the origin of man, you know, and the very top circle would be Lucy, and then all of us would be under it. And so look at what it says next to the very first top of the pyramid, nursery population. So we published several papers, and this was the final one where there was no way around it. All of the population in California, all of it originated from a population of the pathogen that was in nurseries, ornamental nurseries in this case. Um, so this is one that moves through the air. Um, it, it, we're lucky that it moves inside raindrops. So it can't move very far. For instance, the one that caused the um, potato farming, it could actually move long distance in the wind because it, it, the spores could dry up. This one can't. So this one needs to be inside a, um, a droplet and it's very big, it's very big. And so it's so heavy that it, it doesn't move very far. So normally in one year, we don't expect it normally to move it more than a mile. Uh, but it has the most incredible ability to uh, produce spores that I've ever seen. So uh, one or two weeks after it starts raining, the, um, the uh, leaves that are infected will produce millions of spores very, very rapidly. Differently from the other Phytophthora that we were mentioning earlier on, this one goes in the soil, it can be found in the soil, but the soil doesn't really play an epidemiological role. So infection is really plant to plant and it happens through the air. And this is what it looks like. So just to give you an idea. And this is what it does to oaks and tan oaks. So it basically goes inside the bark. The bark can be intact. It just goes through the lenticels and that it starts eating away at the cambium, which you know is the live part of the tree. And um, the tree tries to resist and produces this oozing liquid, yeah. but it can't. Um, it includes sudden oak death. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah so, so it can't, it can't really, um, the tree can't really survive. And, and unfortunately, the pathogen grows very fast across the circumference of the tree. If it went up and down, it would cause maybe die back of one branch, but because it, mo it moves across the circumference, it girdles the tree. And um, we did some experiments where a tree was girdled in two months, uh, 200, old, 200 year old trees. So that's why it's, um, it's, it's so important. So remember what I was saying at the beginning, multiple introductions are scary. So imagine how many plants were being bought with nobody knew about this organism. And um, rhododendrons, which were big carriers, can actually be asymptomatic. So they can be infected, they don't show any symptoms for months. And so they were probably one of the main ways that the pathogen became established. And so we were able to do um, a genetic study showing that the, in, about, in a period of about 10 years, the pathogen was introduced in at least, what did I write here, 12? <laughs> I can see it, uh, it's from a long time ago. It was introduced almost simultaneously in 12 different parts of California, Northern California, and as far as three, 400 miles from one another. And this is why sudden death, once we discovered it, um, it exploded really fast, but it wasn't moving very fast. It was already there. It just built up locally. Each one of these pink dots is actually a site where I was able to prove the pathogen had been introduced. And so and there's, there's more north and south. And so you can imagine how scary it was because all of a sudden we had, you know, this disease and it's called sudden of death, but in reality, the process takes, you know, uh, before an oak is infected, it may take years. Then once it's infected, the oak can actually die quite rapidly, but it's, it's really not that sudden. It's only our understanding of it that there was sudden more than the disease. 
And it's very interesting to point out something. So sudden death works in a very interesting way. So oaks are um, dead end hosts. So an oak never infects another oak. So the main host that spreads the disease is actually California Bay Laurel. So California, in California Bay Laurel, the disease is very mild. It doesn't cause anything. It actually infects the leaves. And you can see a leaf that's infected here on the left. And on those little black spots, it produces millions of these spores, and then these spores end up on the oak and they infect the oak. The oak never produces numbers of the spores large enough to infect another oak. So it is basically a dead end host. So we, it took us years to figure it out because we were just focusing our attention on oaks. We were missing that the little black spot on the, on the bay laurel was actually responsible for spreading the disease throughout the state. Um, which was which was a complication. Um, and when is this happening? Well, remember the Phytophthora comes from, it's in the same kingdom as kelp, remember water. So um, there is a very close link, we, even if this particular Phytophthora spreads in the air, it's still connected to water. And it only produces, um, I don't, oh, unfortunately, maybe you don't see the above see here. Uh, maybe you eliminate it. But you see those curves, that's when the spores are in the air and it's only in the spring months. And you see the rest of the year, nothing, because there is water is needed for the pathogen to actually infect the host, to penetrate the tissue. And so the pathogen is very smart. It doesn't produce spores unless there is rainfall. Thank God it hasn't learned to use fog yet. It still needs rain. So everything happens during the rainy season. And so when we look at sudden or death, um, we are, are, you know, we see the trees that are dying, but in order to understand why the trees are dying, we need to understand that every single oak was infected by a bay laurel that was next to it. Um, and also, even if it's a phytophthora, we have to understand that the soil plays no role in the spread of the disease. And so this is very interesting because, and you see these papers here, um, uh, this is the first plant disease that has a cycle similar to human diseases, where uh, this is West Nile virus, the, uh, the horse and the humans are the oaks, and the mosquito is the bay laurel. So basically the pathogen has two different hosts, and the hosts play a very different role. Um, we have the same case. And so when I suggested this, people told me, well, you have to provide more evidence that that's the case. So I looked at the literature, and it happens that the same thing for malaria, for all of these diseases that host with different roles, epidemiologically speaking, the genetics of the pathogen is different because you need some genetic traits the, when you are in a host that's transmissive, uh, you need to maintain those. And when you're in the dead end host, you don't need to maintain those. So genetically, you should see some differences when you compare populations in the two. And we were actually able to do that. So we were able to show that genetically some traits were lost in the dead end host. There was a different type of evolution in the dead end host than there was in the transmissive host, Bay Laurel. And so there was a definitive proof that this cycle is actually true. And it's the first time for a plant disease that this was shown to be the case. So, um, Everybody has been talking about social distancing. One of the interesting things, one of the benefits for oaks, this works for oaks, for tannox is a different story. But for oaks, remember what I told you, that every oak is infected by a bay laurel that's nearby. So we found out that if you take away bay laurels around the oaks for about 30 feet, the likelihood of that oak becoming infected goes basically down to zero, okay? Um, and so this is a way here on you know, the, the graph on the left shows you the likelihood of infection of an oak as it moves away, as we move away from a bay laurel. So imagine on the y axis you would have a bay laurel, and then the infection goes down as the oak is further and further away. So you can see that after a few feet, it, it's almost a zero. So we did a long, a long term study where we actually removed bays and we tested what was going on. And you can see two lines on the right hand side. So one uh, is the line of infection uh, with the base not removed, the top one. And the bottom line is the number of infections. It's, it's, a, it's an index, so it's difficult to explain, uh, but the difference is huge. Uh, the number of infections when bay laurels were removed. And one of the big issues is you're aware that bay laurels don't really belong to most of our woodlands. Bay laurels are, should be riparian species. 
But because of fire exclusion, they have become really invasive. So we have kind of screwed up the ecosystem twice and in two different ways. One, by excluding fire, we have let these invasive species take over, where now it's present everywhere where it shouldn't be. And then two, we have introduced the pathogen and the pathogen uses Babel. So it's both, <laughs> on both counts, it is, it, is, it is our fault. So how do we, you know, one of the greatest things, I mean, I was very depressed having discovered this organism and finding, you know, being, you know, I was called the father of sudden of death, which made me think about the 60 million trees that have died. Uh, I was very depressed. And then I realized that now that we, after 10 years of research, we understood that we could just remove a few bay laurel trees and we would save the oaks. Um, there was actually a, a solution. All we had to do is tell people to do it. And we also had to be conservative and tell people to do it only if there was a risk of infection. And so I started a citizen science program. It's called the Sudden of Death, of Death Blitzes. And you're welcome to join. There's a, two in the Bay, two in the East Bay, one in San Francisco, several in the peninsula, uh, five in Sonoma County, two in Marine County. So in the spring, a uh, large number of volunteers go out and they survey and sample bay laurel trees. And they, we test it in the lab. And if there is an infection, we put it on the map. And you can see the map on the left-hand side. If you see a red dot, it's actually confirmed the presence of the pathogen. A green dot is a tree that was tested, but the pathogen was not found. And we have created an app and you can stand in front of your oak and you can click a button and the app will tell you if your oak is at risk of becoming infected because the survey is being so extensive that now we have good data for the entire state of California and it gets updated every, every year. So if there is an infected bay laurel within a short distance from the oak and you may not be able to tell, but the app knows <laughs> and the app will tell you. And so then you can decide um, whether you want to protect your oak. You can also apply a um, really benign chemical. So um, remember I was telling you the sudden of death is actually four different pathogens, but in California, we only have one. Well, we only add one until last year. So last year where the big white arrow is, we actually found the European group of the pathogen. So genetically completely different. Um, you're used to the term variant now. This is not a variant. This is a mega variant because it's very, very, very different. And if you look here on, on the right hand side, this table, it's a paper I published last year. It was very timely. I didn't know. Uh, but the USDA uh, asked me, the federal government actually asked me to compare the, the three different lineages, they're called, uh, the, that are present in U.S nursery, ornamental nursery. We only have any one in the forest. You can see here the first one. And you see the P here is the, the difference between the three different lineages. You can see that that value is significant. So if it's less than 0 0.5, it's significant. So this shows that the three different groups of strains are very different. Now this new strain is actually more aggressive and it's a game changer. And unfortunately, the government doesn't really have a mechanism in place to really protect California from the other strains. This could have been avoided, but the government decided that the coast of California already had sudden or death. So they don't need to worry about another strain arriving, except that this strain arrived, which is completely different. And so even if it's you know called the same, it has been isolated from the one that we already had for more than 200,000 years. And now it's together and um, it's gonna cause a different way of disease. So it's gonna be, you know, the two together are gonna cause much more mortality. So we don't really know. It's still, it's right there in the northernmost corner of the coast, but we don't know really what the future holds. Third example, um, agriculture. Remember I was telling you a lot of the pathogens that are in agriculture, we know now we have several examples of these pathogens actually jumping out of the agricultural setting into forest settings. And unfortunately, it's another Phytophthora. Um, and the one that I showed you at the beginning of the talk when I said I thought it was wildfire. So this is the one that comes from Papua New Guinea and it is uh, present in um, almost all over the world in uh, orchards. Uh, avocado in particular, but also almond orchards. Um, it's also present in the ornamental plant industry. And uh, we made a, a big discovery when we started studying it. So nobody was interested in this because again, oh, it's just in agriculture. So let the, the 
people in agriculture deal with it. And then people started calling me Southern California and their oaks, imagine their coast live oak, which are incredibly adapted to drought. So they were, they, were, they were dying. And the reason why they were dying is because this particular Phytophthora prunes the root system. So even if it doesn't kill the tree, it, it really reduces the root system, which makes the tree from drought to tolerant to drought intolerant. So the first time after the, the, the pathogen is eaten away the roots, the tree is alive, but then when the first drought comes, the tree, the tree dies. And this organism moves very easily through the soil and the water. It goes in the aquifer, it moves through the aquifer. So it moves actually quite, quite rapidly. So, so much that it is one of the 100 most invasive organisms in, in the world. And originally it was probably introduced in North America in the 1800s. This is why, you know, and it causes a disease. If some of you are from the East Coast, there's a disease called little leaf disease of loblolly pine. And it's a, it's a disease that shortens the lifespan of, of, of pine, especially in agricultural, in, in settings that were originally agricultural, then reclaimed by the forest. So basically through agriculture, they introduce the pathogen and the, um, the pathogen then uh, when the trees are planted on top of that, the, those trees can really survive very long. Cinnamoma, the same pathogen is also responsible for the demise of chestnuts. Because you may have heard about chestnut blight, but you don't know that chestnut blight only killed the chestnuts in the Northern part of the range, but all of the chestnuts in the Southern part of the range, they were also actually killed um, in a slower, a slower, at a slower pace by, by Phytophthora cinnamoma. And so again, these are the pictures that I wanted to show you. Um, this is a healthy manzanita stand on the Sierra Foothills. This is one after Phytophthora cinnamoma has been in it. And um, this is a, a tree, so 100% mortality. With oaks, we, we found out that 27% of oaks in a, in a large area in a, in San Diego County were infected by the pathogen. So large scale modifications of, of the ecosystem. And um, we now have three distinct outbreaks. Uh, we have the one on Oaks in Southern California. We have the one on Manzanitas in the Sierra Nevada foothills. And then in the Bay Area, we have um, outbreaks uh, that affect Pacific Madrone, you know, the beautiful tree. When you see dying, mostly it's because of Cedamomai. Some local manzanitas, unfortunately, some rare ones too. And also bay laurels are, are affected by, so this was unexpected. And so we, we actually did a genetic study to understand whether these three outbreaks were all caused by the same organism. And we went all over the world and, and obtained strains of the pathogen. And you see these three different colors. These are actually three different groups of strains. And the green one is the original one that comes from Papua New Guinea. The orange one is the one that basically, when, when the green one arrived in North America, it became established. And the orange one is the one that has now become basically endemic to North America, even if it's a, a very exotic pathogen. And then we discovered a third strain. We, we, we see the purple one. Um, and so these are genetically different. And, and here are the, 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 the it's, a, it's, we don't need to worry about this, but we, what we were able to show, we were able to show that different strains were causing different outbreaks. And we were able to show that the same identical strain was present in an agricultural setting that was near the plants that were dying. And we found out the avocados were the source of the infestation in oaks. And we, were, we found out that in the Bay Area, one of the major sources where one of them was ornamentals, but the other one was Christmas trees. And this was very unexpected. So Christmas trees started, um, and we were able to connect some of that um, infection in Christmas trees came from Mexico. So people traded Christmas trees with Mexico and we, uh, we obtained um, a strain from Mexico. So here it's, so this is actually a true representation of the travels of this pathogen. So you see it comes from uh, East Asia, uh, Australasia actually, then, uh, it, it came to America, probably stopping through Europe sometimes, we, we didn't know. And then you can see there is a spread within the continent. And then you can see the purple one is actually the spread from Mexico into, into California. Right now in California, we have all, all three different groups of strains. 
The one from Christmas trees is new. It's a brand new strain. It's a strain that's completely different. You know, it's like saying the, you know, we have COVID and we had the cold before, but the government doesn't really want to accept that. And so we, we run a study and we called it WW2, worldwide two. And these are all the other strains that are present throughout the world. And the higher the, the line, the more disease the strain causes. So you can tell me by looking at this data, that obviously this new strain is not the same as the other ones that we, have, we already have in California. It's obviously not much worse. And so the question that I have is, shouldn't the government be also doing something to avoid the spread of WW2? Because that is not the same as the other ones and the other ones are already causing mortality every time that they escape the agricultural setting. And so I actually wrote a paper, we, we did some, some studies, we wanted to predict if which California ecosystems could suffer the most. And here I had them in line, we were able to generate good data for, for these um, three different tree species. And uh, Pacific Madrone is much more susceptible to Douglas fir and much more susceptible to Betel in general, to multiple strains. And so obviously uh, I can see how the future of Pacific Madrone may be pretty grim in the Bay Area because we already have Sidomome. So, um, so we, we have identified commodities, agricultural commodities, ornamental plants, again, Christmas trees, avocados that are responsible for the introduction of these pathogens in California. And um, involuntarily, they're also responsible for the introduction in forest settings. We have different strains in different woodlands because each, each woodland has a strain that matches the commodity that's next to it. And we have shown that some strains are, are emergent and that they're more aggressive. And we also shown that some hosts are, are more at risk. So, you know, again, once you've seen the manzanita that looks like it's burnt by wildfire, once they're established, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing really we can do. So really preventing movement of soil from infested sites to other sites is the only thing that can be done. And this is what BLM is doing in Sierra Nevada to prevent the movement of... of but the, uh, the other issue is not just with this particular one, but with the other phytophthoras too, like the ones in the restoration plants, um, we need to be able to stop the, the, the sale of these plants if they are infected. And so how do we do that? And I'm very proud to say, and, and you should be proud too of Berkeley that supported me. We, in 2004, after fighting with the US government for years, I was able to talk to US government into together with others, but they really spearheaded the effort to use the same test that we use now for COVID to use DNA-based test for uh, Phytophthora or Amorum. And then the government decided to use it for any uh, plant pathogen of interest. Until 2004, they were just looking and saying, oh yeah, this, this, this plant is clean. <laughs> this plant is not clean, you know, you couldn't, and you can't tell, you just, you know, how can you tell if a person has COVID or not if you're not symptomatic? The same thing is true for plants. So it was kind of a ridiculous system in place. Now we have this test, but again, the problem is how do we, you know, how do we deal with numbers? So how can we test really large, you know, large numbers? Um, the numbers are gigantic and you know, it was, it was a big problem to get everybody tested for COVID. Um, and so we are, we are devising new methods. One of them is to use dogs. So dogs can actually smell Phytophthora in a fraction of a second. And so we are able to, we have two dogs now trained that they can do the job. They can actually smell hundreds of plants literally in a couple of minutes. Or we can test the water that's runoff from the, from the pots when they are watered. But this requires testing the plants before they're sold. But there is a will. So these, these things that we're doing are actually being used now. We did the first test at the Presidio this year with our dogs, and it was a very successful dog. So there is the will to change, but I, obviously not enough has been done. Two more short examples, because as you can see, there's many threats to our forest. One of them is a fungus now. So we're moving away from these phytophthora. This is a fungus called Aetrobasidium, and it's the most damaging root disease of conifers in the world, uh, but actually, if you were, if we were lucky enough to go to, to to go back in time and come to our California forests before Europeans arrived, Etrobasidium would be not very frequent. 
And it would be actually very important because it would kill the older trees and it would allow for the younger trees to come in. But unfortunately, um, and I'll show you in the, with this next slide what happened, in California forests, because of the very intensive logging that started in the 1880s for a century until the 1980s, uh, the pathogen has become emergent. So it's now prevalent in, uh, in uh, California forests. And now I'll tell you something that's a very interesting story. So we have two different species of this pathogen. One kills pines, junipers, incense cedars, and some angiosperms. And the other one kills true firs, hemlocks, Douglas firs, and sequoias. And the second one, and there's a mistake in the spelling, but the second one is one of those that can really live inside the tree as an endophyte. So it can spend literally 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years inside the tree without doing anything. So it's just there. And then all of a sudden, when the condition become favorable, it becomes favorable, it becomes a pathogen. So if you've been to um, Yosemite, when you, drive your, when you used to be able to drive your car, you would get to these openings and you would be able to see El Capitan and the falls. And you would think, oh, how nice it is that there is an opening right here so I can get a beautiful view of the mountains. Well, those openings are not natural. <laughs> those openings are actually caused by Aeterobasidium and Armillaria, but two different root diseases. And you can see the trees have been killed in this picture that, that was taken in, in, the, um, in the 80s. These trees were killed and the opening is made, but it's not a natural grassland. It's not a natural meadow. It's actually, that shows you what the, 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 the effect of these root rots can be. And so why, why did logging cause such an increase from a disease that was almost you know, unnoticeable to a disease that's prevalent? It's because of stumps. And in the graph on top, you can actually see a graphic representation of the life cycle. So the spores are in the air, and they become established in a forest stand through a stump. And then through the roots of the stump, they infect the roots of living trees and they kill them. And then if there is another stump, they'll use the stump also to produce spores that are windblown and they will infect another stump and become established again. So the more stumps we have, the more disease we have. So you understand that when the forests were completely logged, that opened the door for, a, you know, a fathomable, a fathomable number of, of infections. And this is why now it's, it's a big deal. So you say, okay, this is a good story. It's interesting, but it actually gets a lot more interesting because originally, remember I was telling you there's two different species. The two species are kind of relatively partitioned. So normally the, where you have more pines, so on the east side of the Sierra, you have more of one species. And on the west slopes of the Sierra Nevada, you have more of the other species because you have more fur. So one likes the drier weather, one likes the wetter weather. But because of fire exclusion, now we have firs growing everywhere. And there's a picture here. Look, look up this incredibly dense forest. And it's almost all firs. So firs have become invasive now in California. And with fur, they also bring the pathogen that's specific to fur. And so two things have happened. Unfortunately, sequoias originally were not infected by the pathogen, but now there's a lot of true furs around the sequoias. And so those furs have infected sequoias. You can see the picture here on the right hand side is a giant sequoia with a person standing. I don't know if you can see that, it's an old picture. So this sequoia was killed by the fur version of the pathogen that moved from a fur root into a sequoia. And of course, sequoias, you know, it's something that we really want to protect. But something even crazier is happening because firs and pines are together. You know what happens on stumps? Both species of the pathogen fall on the same stump. And then something crazy happens. These two species have been completely isolated for 50 million years genetically, but they can still have sex and they can mate. And so when I was a student, I found out in 1998, that the two in California where there were stumps, the two species were hybridizing. And um, that was it. I didn't, you know, and in, in this paper in 1998, I said, we don't really know what the consequences of two different species coming together because of humans. And, you know, and, and because the two pathogens are, you know, brought together by the change in the forest because we have stumps and because we have firs and pines together and we have firs in massive numbers. This is our fault, but I didn't know what genetically it meant. And then my student, one of my students 10 years later, 
she found out that this, um, the two species had been exchanging genetic material. So it wasn't just them having sex, they're actually having children and the children were functional. And so, but we didn't really have any evidence of, of speciation. And then two years ago, this was not in California, but remember I was telling you, we couldn't predict what the outcome was going to be. Well, I went to Montana and the same thing probably is happening in California. We just have to find, you see the green? The green is actually a different species and it's created by the red. The red is the one on pine and the blue is the one on fir. And the two have come together in this part of Montana because of extensive logging. And they've created a third species that's genetically different from the red and the blue. And um, this green species, uh, Eterobazino now has a new host, Alpine larch. So all of the larches that you see there, uh, you can see some of them are just turning color, but some of them are dead or dying. Those are all infected by the new, the green species. So this is again, our fault because we brought together two species that were not supposed to be together. And now the pathogen does what evolution will do and it's out of our control. And now that this third species exists, it's out of our control. So there's nothing we can do. Finally, the last example that I'll talk about today is about what's, what's happening in the Bay Area with all these trees that are dying, but also it's not just happening in the Bay Area, it's also happening, um, well, it's happening on the outskirts of the Bay Area, uh, on Mount Diablo, um, on the slopes, on, on, the, on the warmer slopes. It's also happening on, on the Sierra Nevada foothills. A large number of, we have, uh, basically mortality of trees, but in these four, these four corners, I really wanted to be specific about the kind of trees that are dying. So um, I'll start with the ones that are very obvious to us because um, large scale mortality of planted exotic acacias and eucalyptus. So these are planted, so they don't really belong. Okay, so keep that in mind. Then trees that are native, but have, you know, they've become invasive, like California bay laurels. Remember, I was telling you, it's a riparian species. Now it's everywhere. But the other tree that's kind of invasive is redwoods, not because it's invasive on its own, but because we plant it offsite, right? So we plant redwoods everywhere, you know, even in the, on the East Bay, you know, we plant it in the valley, we plant it everywhere where redwoods really don't really belong. And starting last year, they started, you know, having severe symptoms of dieback. Um, and then Manzanita is growing in very hot conditions on Mount Diablo. And then on the Sierra, ne Sierra Nevada foothills, both blue oaks and gray pines are dying in large numbers. And I'm sure that you know that though, that particular area of California, it's a very harsh environment. These are trees that are champions, you know, both blue oaks and gray pines. They're champions because they can sustain incredibly difficult environment, very difficult environment, and still grow, grow tall. And that's why there's such key elements. Unfortunately, because of climate change, um, the mortality was always happening, but it was limited in scale. But now because of climate change, these trees that are in difficult situations or trees that are off site because they are exotic, like acacias that come from Australia or eucalyptus or bay laurels, <laughs> They are the ones that are, or redwoods that shouldn't be planted on, you know, along a freeway in the, in the valley or even in the East Bay. These are the ones that are starting to large in, uh, die in, in large numbers. And um, this is a picture, you may have seen this. Uh, this is Leona Heights. Um, this is Acacia dieback. This is happening throughout the Bay Area, um, the greater Bay Area. So we're talking large scale, large scale mortality. And so they asked me to figure out what was going on. And I can tell you that it is an infectious, it is infectious diseases that um, are, are killing them. They are emergent diseases and um, they actually, uh, you know, the story is complicated, but here on the left, I have all the, each one of these dots is many, many trees that we sampled and the different colors of different tree species, just to give you an idea. So we, we have done a pretty good, uh, a pretty good effort. And in every single one of these sites, not in every single tree because um, uh, often <laughs> you don't get anything of trees because they're, they're already dead. But when you get the tree at the right, at the right stage, um, in every single case, we found what we call latent pathogens. So these are what, remember when I was telling you about Eterobazidium that can live for decades inside a tree without causing disease? 
this is what latent pathogens are. So we found different latent pathogens um, in different tree species. So each tree species has its own one to three latent pathogens. And these latent pathogens um, have, co you know, probably coexisted with these trees for decades. But right now, they, uh, they, uh, they're all become extremely aggressive. So they go from being neutral or maybe even beneficial, they go to, they become, all of a sudden become killers. The problem is, and we know what triggers it. So this has been studied. Um, this was thought to be kind of an um, exceptional case, but people in the UK, they studied this decades ago and, and we know it's actually really the, the lack of water. So, but not, not because the, the, trees are, the trees have enough water to survive. So it's not the drought that's killing the trees, but it's the water pressure that's decreasing inside the trees. And we know that when water pressure goes below a certain threshold, these microbes turn from being be be beneficial, benign to being pathogenic. So they, they start causing disease. So it's a switch that gets that gets turned on, and of course you understand it is this is very um uh, this is very scary because almost every tree has these organisms inside of it, okay? So there's not much that we can do, right? And because the climate is changing, there's nothing that we can do to lift the water pressure again. I mean, yes, if we have one tree that we want to say we can try to water it, that will cause other problems. But obviously at the scale, you know, if you look at this, it's not like I'm gonna go around and water this stand to bring back the, these acacias. And unfortunately, if, you know, these latent pathogens that become aggressive, after a certain point, there's, there's kind of no turning back. These are infectious. So what happens is they're incredible. So first they live in symbiosis with the tree, inside the tree without doing anything, maybe actually being beneficial. Then um, when the tree weakens a little bit, and we may not even notice that it weakens, but they can sense it, it becomes aggressive. And then once it's killed the tree, it actually thrives on the dead tree and it sporulates and it produces spores. And then the spores will infect other trees and the, 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 the cycle will start. And, and the endophytic stage usually lasts at least one year, but it could last 50 years or hundred years. It, it all depends on the physiological condition of the tree. So it is an infection, they are infectious, but um, they're difficult to deal with because they are already inside the tree. And because they're already inside the tree, they can cause very large outbreaks in a very, very short period of time because all of, all of them are triggered at the same time. So if an entire stand is undergoing the same issues, all of them will be triggered and they will, be, they will, start, killing, they will start killing the tree. Um, and so and interestingly, when you look at these colors here, each one of these different colors, which it's a different tree species, they actually, it actually has its own group of latent pathogens. For instance, I'll just give you two examples. In acacias, the latent pathogens of acacias have jumped from California plants onto acacias, okay? In the case of eucalyptus, which is also undergoing the same thing, um, eucalyptus brought this pathogen with it. So the pathogens that eucalyptus has that are very aggressive now, uh, are specific to eucalyptus and they, they come from Australia. Luckily, the eucalyptus ones don't seem to be generalists. So they don't seem to be able to infect other trees, but the one in acacias are generalists. And so there is an added concern that these large number of acacias that are dying, they will produce so many spores that other you know, native trees may become infected and then they may start their own cycle. You know, and, and in, um, the native trees, uh, they, they all have their own group of latent pathogens. In that case, also they are native to California the pathogens. So we've always known about them. We just didn't expect that climate change would have been so fast. And so actually until two or three years ago, everybody was so worried about sudden of death being the major driver of change in our forest. But now I'm thinking, it is these latent pathogens that are gonna be the major drivers because every single tree has them. And as climate changes, basically the tree becomes super susceptible to the organism that they already carry inside of them. Uh, so again, this is really the problem. And um, there is a concern because some of these are generalists so they can infect multiple hosts.
So we ran some experiments. You can see the box on the left down, and that's the symptom that they cause. So you can see that it starts there and it actually kills the cambium. You see where it's reaching the cambium. It kills the cambium and then the, the tree will be girdled or the stem will be girdled. And so we actually inoculated healthy plants. And every time you see a blue arrow, we were able to show statistically that these latent pathogens were actually aggressive. So they were, um, you know, we, 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 proved, we proved that it was not just uh, coincidence, you know, it was not just correlation. You know, when people die, they always have a glass of water. So you could think, oh, it's a glass of water that's killing everybody, but it's not, right? So it's the same thing. This could be just secondary organisms, but we were able to show that these are now secondary organisms. And so these are a very, you know, simple way to, to, to remember this is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So this is, this is really what these organisms are. They're Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde pathogens. And because of what I briefly explained to you, I think these are gonna be major drivers of change together with exotic diseases as well. But I think these ones on their own will be a major force and this is gonna happen fast. So now what's gonna happen really? So this is a graph of the future, okay? And those colored lines is this, you know, the, what will our forest look like? The closer the line is to the uh, X axis, the horizontal axis, the more the forest will remain the way we know them. The higher up the line is, the more different the forest will be. And so as you can see, we already have significant changes. So we are on that blue line that crosses all the three different colored lines. But unfortunately, we do not know which color, you know, what's really happening. I, I don't know oh. the future. So I know what happened in the past, and so I could calculate what happened in the past, but it could be that maybe things will go back, maybe rain will come back and things will go back to normal, so we'll be in a scenario two, or maybe this latent pathogen will remain aggressive and infect more hosts, and so we'll be in a scenario number one, or maybe more likely, and in a more conservative way, if I had to choose one, I would probably choose three just to be safe. And I would say we're gonna see cycles. So as we have mega droughts, the line is going to be go, going to go up. If we have weather periods, it will go down, but it will never go back to normal. So you see that that valley is always higher than the baseline. So mm -hmm. inevitably, there's going to be change, but how fast that change is, is to be seen. So I, you know, I have to be realistic. It could, it could also be that maybe we are looking at something that's two. So maybe we'll go back to normal, but I really, everything tells me that it's not really the case. And so final conclusions. So. Um, I told you, I, I, you know, I, I could have talked about many more of the examples, but I just wanted to present the ones that I've been working on lately, the ones that you see in front of you, the ones that you've heard about, and also some of the probably you hadn't heard about. And again, remember the issue here is repeated introductions. When we talk about exotic pathogens, repeated introduction is the key. So we can't be cavalier about allowing the organisms to be introduced again and again and again, even if they've already been introduced. And so the question is, why don't we have a better system in place? We should learn once we know there is an introduced exotic organism, we should figure out how it was introduced and really strictly try to control further introductions. Different strains, of a pathogen are different. So I am very upset with the federal government because we have been telling, all of us scientists, we've been telling the government, you need to protect California from the different sudden of death strains. We only had one, but there's three other ones in, 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 you know, in the industrialized world. We don't want the other three ones. We, we don't want any other ones because each strain causes a different type of disease, but they didn't listen to us. And sure enough, now we have two two strains in California. We could have prevented that. Big question, why are we moving ornamental plants across the world? Do we really need to do that? No, we don't need to do that, but the ornamental plant industry is the second agricultural industry for profit, not only in this country, but in the world. So obviously they have strong lobbying power and um, they keep doing business as usual, which is the, uh, most of the plants are grown in warm climates, California, Oregon, Florida for the United States, for North America, um, Italy and Spain for, for Europe. And then the plants are moved throughout the continent. So if 
the place where the, the plants are grown during the warm season, or the cold season, that's warm, where they're grown, if they become infected there, then for sure, the infestation is gonna to move to the, the entire continent. And that's how sudden death was moved around. Um, and the other thing is a lot of introductions are happening. We are publishing about it, but I think they're under the radar. And a lot of it, again, you know, they come from agricultural and uh, even the California Department of Food and Agriculture is um, declined to do anything about pathogens that are already established in agriculture. Even if we tell them, look, in agriculture, you can actually control these pathogens because you can use chemicals, because you can change crop. But once they move into a natural setting, you can't control them anymore. So why should the forest bear the brunt of the benefits that are reaped by the industry and then not, nobody can do anything about it? Shouldn't the industry also be responsible for financing the control of the pathogen to make sure that it doesn't go out of the agricultural setting? Big questions. When we talk about the emergent pathogens, um, you know, the native pathogens can be as bad when something changes. And when does something change? When we plant the, a tree in the wrong place. And this is what's happening with acacias and, and, and eucalyptus. It turns out the acacias actually are not drought tolerant, at least not blackwood acacia. It was thought to be drought tolerant, but it's not. And it's clear that it's not. So a lot of mistakes were made. And those mistakes now we're, we're paying them because we shouldn't plant trees where they don't really belong. We have mismanaged our forest logging and fire exclusion. And I told you logging generated the stumps and because of the stumps, these root rots are everywhere. Now they're infecting sequoias, they're infecting firs, pines, and they're hybridizing. Fire exclusion is bringing, you know, it's, it's allowing for too many trees. And when you have too many trees, you have no social distancing, which means infectious disease can spread very easily. Sudden of death is the classic example. Fire exclusion allowed for California bay laurel to thrive way too many numbers, about probably three times as large as they should be. And uh, because of the larger numbers of bay laurels, now we have sudden or death the way we know it, because we have a vector that's basically everywhere. Um, and these latent pathogens, that's probably the most difficult issue. But again, um, by, uh, you know, we have native plants in harsh climates and those unfortunately will, will suffer. Um, and um, you know, the other ones that don't belong, they're gonna be taken out, but maybe we shouldn't really care. But what I'm telling you is, and I, I don't wanna come across as being cynical, is that everything I see tells me that because of these latent pathogens, we can't expect to maintain the forest the way they were 20, 30 years ago. We have to accept change. And some change may not be what we want because we may actually have to lose some species. Some species just may not be adapted to California anymore. And so in some cases, maybe we can assist their migration. So for instance, in the Sierra Furials, maybe we can move blue oaks and uh, gray pine higher up, uh, but that's gonna require a lot of effort and investment. That is obviously a solution that potentially could work. So if we wanna keep this, these species, and that would be a wise investment, we need to actually assist their movement because climate change is happening too fast. So you know the plants can move by the seed moves little by little, but it's, it's happening too fast for the movement to occur. So we need to assist this plant. So we may choose some that we want to assist, and then we just have to be realistic and we may accept that some are gonna go. And I, I know that this is not a very popular thing to say. I am a true, I, am a, I like conservation 100%. That's why I do this job. But at some point, our resources are going to be limited. And I would like to put the effort where I know there's going to be a result. And not just, you know, we can actually save some species by choosing the right species to save. And unfortunately, some other ones, we will have maybe some rituals and ceremonies and slowly we'll say goodbye to them. But it's been very difficult in the conservation world to, to bring this message across because they think that if you say this, then you're not a true conservationist. And I, I dare to disagree. I think we need to make some choices based on science. So we need to have enough data to make the choices. But everything is telling me that the trends are way too significant. And also we need to, to remember that the forest we know uh, 
probably is not the way the forests were before we were here. You know, I mean, I found this picture of, of the Claremont Hotel. Look at the hills behind. You know, first of all, all of the trees near the hotel are all planted. But uh, look at the, at the hills behind. They're barren. They're grasslands. And most of the area probably really was a grassland. Now, I'm not saying that we need to go back to the grassland entirely, but we also need to accept that our idea, our paradigm of what the right type of environment is may be skewed by our own experience and not really by the natural history of a, of a certain environment. This is my website. I wanted to showcase with some cool things. This Feral Atlas is a cool interactive project. Uh, I was a curator of a really big art show where we are learning from artists to ask certain questions about trees. It's called Tree Time. You can find it on the website. You can find all these cool things about wood decay and tree facts. There's a fire uh, outreach page. You would be very interested in going there, uh, especially if you live uh, in the East Bay or, or if you don't live in San Francisco, that's definitely something that's gonna be useful to you. Um, so I encourage you to, to go to mateolab.org. And then I'm, if you feel generous, there is a donate button on my website. And um, we uh, have a large number of undergraduates that uh, um, want to be trained and that requires a, a large amount of money. And so any money you give us goes towards undergraduate education and training. Um, and uh, it's fully tax deductible. So again, if you feel generous, donations are always welcome. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm totally open to questions, of course. Yes, I'd, I'd like to ask a question if I may. Of course, Jeff Kennedy. Hi, Jeff. Um, so, so this is very uh, low tech and, and simplistic, but there's a lot of interest uh, given the um, horrendous increase in the the intensity and scope of wildfires to thin the forests uh, and uh, reduce ladder fuels and so forth. And and my question has to do with um, what I'll call tool hygiene. So you go into the forest to do that work and you have maybe a chainsaw or you have uh, hand pruning saws. And it seems to me it would be very easy to spread a pathogen from one species to another unless you sterilize the tool in between each application. I and mean, what's, the, what's the best practice for uh, not spreading disease when you manage the forest? Yeah, so um, first of all, yeah, so yes, you're right. So th this definitely happens. It probably doesn't happen as much as, as you may want to think, you think, or I think. I think that actually artificially moving pathogens is more difficult than, than, than we think, but, but um, there are some pathogens that can be moved more easily than others. So there has to be knowledge of what you're dealing with locally. Because that will, you know, for instance, when we had uh, pine pitch canker, you remember a few years ago, that was really, I mean, we still have it, but it was really, um, you know, the outbreaks were really significant. You would have all these uh, dead pines. That particular pathogen is very easy to move around because it produces a large amount of, you know, microscopic sticky spores. So, so that's a case where knowing what you're dealing with definitely makes a difference. Um, the other thing is uh, moving plant material, again, is probably the most dangerous thing. So it's not so much moving the tools around, using the tool on one tree than the other, because the chances that you, you will be able to infect another tree by chance are fairly small. But if your tools are very, the dirtier they are, the more soil, the more plant material there on the tools, that increases the likelihood of that happening. So, so the idea is, and also, you know, realistically, you can't probably, you know, completely clean your tools in between every tree. If you're doing right. work, it's, it's not realistic. But normally what, what, what I tell people is, look, first of all, know what you're dealing with. You know, what, what kind of issues are present in, in the stand? And, and, and number two, the first thing to do is make sure that the, the, the tools look clean. 
okay? So that is kind of the most important thing with, with some rare exception. So, and, and, and make sure that when, when you leave a property or a stand and you move to a different stand, then you should, you know, that's when you should make sure that you don't bring any debris or any dirt with you as you move from, you know, from one property to the other one. So, um, you know, in the case of those soil borne phytophthora, uh, that is a problematic because the soil is, is infested, right? And that's why BLM has completely closed down the roads because people that are walking on the roads are just carrying it. So if you have one of those, then the issue really becomes, you know, make sure that you don't move this. The soil is kind of the number one, you know, thing that you, you, you have to worry about. And so how do you deal with that? Well, for instance, what I tell people is, you know, the drier the soil is, the less, first of all, the less likely it is that these pathogens will be sporulating because remember they are water, <laughs> originally they come from water. So there will be less spores around. And second, it will be, let, you know, the amount of soil that attaches to your tools and to your shoes will be, you know, less, you know, um, less significant. So at the beginning of, you know, when we were dealing with sudden of death, we were, because it was a phytophthora, we were telling people to do most of their yard work during the fall. We still do, um, because we, um, uh, we were, uh, trying to minimize the spread of, of the disease by, by spreading in, in infested soil. And then the other issue is um, wounding. You know, that's the other thing is if some pathogens will preferentially infect a tree through wounds. And so again, um, if you work in the dry seasons, there's less pathogen that can successfully do that. Um, and so in general, I recommend that if, if, if uh, tree health is an issue, um, if you do the work during the dry season, you actually cut down the risk significantly. And then again, uh, good hygiene means making, making the, you know, you don't, have, you don't have to bleach all the tools all the time, but just brush them, clean them with water, just make them, you know, if you, if you make them look clean, the chance that you're actually carrying microscopic spores, interestingly, goes down significantly. If you have specific diseases like pine pitch canker, that that, is, that complicates things because then you do need to use, uh, you know, Lysol or bleach or something like that. So it's important to know what you're dealing with. But there is a basic protocol that applies to everything that's also doable for workers. You know that it's not going to drive them crazy. And can that be found on your website? Yeah, we do have the basic uh, we, protocol. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, thank you, Matteo. Uh, Matteo, I just noticed, yeah. I just wanna ask one question for somebody who put it in the chat. Um, they've noticed on the bay laurel leaves, uh, black spots that look like mildew. And they also noticed other brown spotting and they're wondering if either of these things are part of the sudden oak death cycle. Yeah. So no, the, um, the ones that look like mildew, those are called sooty moles. Those are actually, they're growing uh, on the um, sugary excrements of aphids and other things. Uh, those are not, actually they're not associated. So the, if, if it's something that's on top of the foliage, like a mold, uh, it's, it's not sudden or death. If, it's, if the spots are, are you know, if, they, if they're round, and fairly large, uh, it's also probably not sudden or death. But if um, if the spots are small and then the tip is blackened, then it could be sudden or death. So, so unfortunately, even I cannot tell by looking. There's a lot of lookalikes. So there's a lot of uh, there's other phytophthora that are innocuous that cause identical symptoms, and there's fungi that cause cause very similar symptoms. That's why when we, we started the citizen science program, the big deal was to get money to do the test in the lab. So every, everything that's collected by the volunteers is actually tested in the lab. So we know for sure when we put a red on the map, we know it's, it's for sure. It's not because somebody thought it was, you know, that's, that's kind of the big difference. So yeah, so yeah, so if you go on, on my website, you can, you can find guides that tell you what Saturday of death looks like. But even if you're the best tree doctor in the world, you won't be able to know for sure. 
but there are some things that bring you a little bit closer. I mean, one thing that brings you closer is to look at the, at the bay laurel leaf, how it's carried on the tree, because these are water, they use water, right? So if, if the, the tip of the tree is carried downwards, then you, you would expect most of the tip to be blackened if it's a phytophthora. If the, if the leaf is carried with the tip upwards, then you expect the area near the pedial to be blackened. If it's like curved, you expect to have a, a tip and a back, you know what I mean? You expect to have both blackened. So think about where, where would water accumulate on a leaf the way it's naturally carried on the tree. And if you see it on a few leaves, a good match between where you expect water to accumulate and the blackened portion of the leaf, then you're getting closer to, to it may not be the sudden of death phytophthora, but it's at least a phytophthora. So you're getting much, much closer. Liz, I had interrupted you. Oh, oh no, actually I was like you, I was just looking at the chat. Oh. And there are a couple of questions in here. Uh, one was about the, the brown spots on the bay leaves. Another person says, uh, I have a large pot where I planted bay laurel, dawn redwood, and a live oak. They all look okay right now. Do I need to dispose of them? And I would add not only dispose, but maybe separate them. What do you think? Well, so the, okay, so the, if we, if we had this conversation 20 years ago, I would say probably yes. Right now, I think that the, in the Bay Area, the, the big issue is whether your plants are, I mean, of course, you know, you, you, you have to, you know, if a plant gets sick, tossing it like in the backyard is the worst possible idea. So, you know, the, a much better thing is to bury it or even better to compost it. Those are much better, you know, much better options. With regards to sudden or death, I would say 99% of the situations that we had, the outbreaks that we have in the, in the East Bay, which is quite a lot, they, are, they all are at the edges of the mixed uh, oak woodland. And uh, there has to be bay laurel. So basically, if you don't live very close to, if there's no bay laurel trees, uh, it will be, you know, it's almost impossible that it's sudden or death. You have to have either bay laurel trees or tan oaks next to you. So for instance, if you have a, you know, if you live in Sacramento, or if you live in San Francisco and you have a plant that's sick, right now, most of the wave of plants that were sick because they came sick from the nurseries has gone down. So it's fairly unlikely, you know, it's probably something else. So, yeah. Ugh. Okay, somebody else here in the chat says, should oaks and bay laurels be planted together? And this is of interest to me because in my backyard, I also have I have bay laurels and I have uh, coast oaks in my backyard. Should we keep them separate? Yeah, no, you shouldn't plant them together. I mean, in fact, they really probably, I mean, originally, they probably didn't come together except for in the riparian corridors. Um, but now, you know, now, I mean, bay laurels become really invasive. So if you, you know, the, the best thing you can do is to download the app there's an app that's called SOD Map, you know, SOD Map Mobile. Okay. It's, it's free. And then go in your yard and then click, there's a button that says risk. And then it will show you if the risk is, you know, lo low, moderate, or high based on all the trees that are around your yard. And so I normally tell people that if, if it's low, you don't really have to worry too much. But if it's moderate or high, you have to worry. So that's really when it, it may take years for the, for the color to change in your yard because it doesn't move very fast. So with that information, you know, if I had uh, oaks, that's what I would do. I would take the app, I would click, 
uh, I would click the button. And then if it says moderate or high risk, then I would remove the bay laurels that are within, normally we say 30 feet from the oak, but even, you know, even 15 feet is enough. So uh, we play very safe, we say 30, but if you will remove all the bay laurels and it's, it's um, foliage to stem. So if you remove the bay laurels 15 feet from the main stem of the oak, that really brings down the chances of the oak becoming infected uh, quite significantly. Sometimes you may just have one branch of the bay that comes close to the oak, so you could just prune that one. So you want to have at least 15 feet without bay laurel leaves near your oak stem, not, not the branches, the stem. So that gives you an idea of the space. If you could do 30, it's better. And, and what was that website again? Uh, well, the it's it's if you go well, the the, the app is called SODMAP, S O D M A P, SODMAP, okay. and then the second word, mobile. Okay, so mobile, yeah. So that's fantastic. I mean, it does a better job than I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, I use it, I go around and you know, I look, and then sure enough, when the, the app tells me the risk is high. I, I find oaks that are dying, so. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions out there, folks? We have a lot of thank yous, very information. But somebody asked if um, our municipal composting will kill the pathogens. Like yeah, it, it, it will, it actually, it will. The, the problem, <clears throat> Even your composting will, if you do it very, but you have to do it really well, it becomes more difficult. But the municipal will, <clears throat> the problem is theoretically, they're not supposed, I mean, the garden variety pathogens, you know, the ones that are native, you can just uh, bring them at the, you know, the material that composted, no problem. So yeah, so if you want to get rid of uh, infected plants, just put them in the green bin, that's fine. The problem is if you know that you have regulated pathogens like sudden or death, which is regulated, theoretically, you're not supposed to send it to the composting facility. Even they have shown, we have done a huge study showing that in these composting facilities, the, the pathogen is killed, uh, but the, the regulations are that you can. So if you have knowledge that you have it, theoretically, it's against the law, but it's only for regulated pathogens. So, in this case, it would only apply to sudden or death. Is there some way to spray your trees or some, do something to your oak trees to help protect them from sudden oak death other than yeah. remove the laurels 15 you, feet? You can, yes, but, <clears throat> but it has to, I mean, it only, it kind of works only if it's done in addition to the bay removal. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, yeah, so basically, if you have to choose one of the two, I would only choose bay removal. And if you <clears throat> if you have a tree that you really care about because it's really valuable, then I would do both. And so there is it's a spray that you put on the bark, or if the, that works well for trees that are all the way to twenty five inches in diameter. For trees that are bigger, it's actually better to inject this compound uh -huh. and it, it, it increases the immunity. In the it's like a vaccine almost, it increases the immunity in, in the tree. So, and injecting it's, I prefer injecting because in general, you don't just, you know, all, every, all the chemical goes inside the tree and that's the end of the story. And the tree can recover from the little holes that you, you make on the tree. But it, you, know, you need to learn how, you can ask somebody to do it, an arborist, so you can learn yourself. It's not very difficult, but it requires a little, well, spraying it is a lot easier, you know, to spray it. And you have to, if you spray it, you have to be very careful just to spray it on the bark because it will burn the foliage. Okay. So, so it has to be just on the bark. In fact, if you have plants under the oak that you want to, that you like, you should put the tarp on them to make sure they don't get it. And the, the spray, <clears throat> again, but if you spray, you don't remove the base, chances are that eventually it's gonna get infected. So I really recommend remove the base, you know, and again, there's no magic number. So if you, let's say that you, okay, you can only do 10 feet, remove base for 10 feet, that's better than not doing anything. You know what I mean? It's not like a magic number. 
So the more, you know, I would say 30 feet is the, you don't need to, re unless you're like, a, you know, one of those 500, 600 year old oaks, there is very few. And then I tell people for those oaks, I would go all the way to um, uh, 60 feet, you know, but those are incredible. Otherwise, even for a very large oak, 30 feet is more than enough. But really, we notice a difference even with 15. Okay, thank you. Wow, and this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Mateo. Well, thank you. I hope I did it to put you to sleep. No, no, not at all. <laughs> I'm all sweaty just... now because I, I put so much energy when I talk that. <laughs> no, no, no. no. It's, uh, it's so much information. It's, it's uh, a lot to think about. And I thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, please go check my website. There's a lot of cool stuff. If you're into, into art, um, there's this beautiful interactive art show um, that's still ongoing, I think, that uh, I curated the scientific part of it. And uh, there's a wonderful, uh, it's a Stanford support, it's, it's called Feral Atlas, and it's about all different threats to the forest. And it's all interconnected. So you go, you can read about pathogens, and then it takes you to deforestation. It takes you to pollution. It takes you, it's, it's all interconnected, very, very interesting. And we, all the people that participated from all over the world, we kind of let loose a little bit. And we, we said things that we normally wouldn't in a paper. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so there's, so I invite you to go. It's, um, there's, there's a lot of cool things on the website. All right, all right, excellent. Uh, we have recorded this. I'll stop the recording shortly, but just let everybody know that in a couple of weeks, this will be on the Sierra Club website and you can go back and see it all again. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.